Reach Young Adult Ministry Sermons Online from Tuesday, September 24th, 2019 by A.J. Gonzalez, pastor to students at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, entitled Real Obedience from 1 Samuel 15. Well, just to jump right in, uh, we're continuing a series in 1 Samuel. And so that's where we're going to be today. Um, so there is a, a little bit of a mix-up with, with, with PJ and I. Uh, he's planned out this series for us for First Samuel. And I did a poor job at following instructions. And so I actually, like, completely skipped a message. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, a quick little synopsis of what I should have taught tonight. And then I'm going to give you what I am going to teach tonight. Uh, so my bad. Anyways, 1 Samuel is where we're going to be. We're going to be in, in chapter 15, um, but I'm going to kind of try to catch you up a little bit uh, with what happened since PJ taught verses, or chapters 8 through 10. So basically, we've got, uh, we've got the Israelites, and they have come to Samuel, and they have began, uh, begun to beg for a king, which is not a good thing because Samuel's like, the Lord's got you, you're good, you don't need a king, and they just, they won't have it. They continue to argue, they continue to uh, beg for a king and say, we want a king, we need somebody with authority, basically we need someone to tell us what to do because we're not uh, responsible enough to do what we're supposed to do on our own. And how many times do we sometimes we want that in our own life, right? We're like, we don't, we just want, we just want it to be easy, like God, just tell us what to do, like make this decision evident, right? We ask God to do that all the time. Lord, just show me the right way to go. And so um, instead of just like being adults and making godly decisions on our own. And so uh, we see that with them. And so finally in chapter 12, uh, Samuel has this authority because of, because of uh, him being a prophet. And so he says, fine, I will give you a king and I will give you King Saul, but you guys are not going to like it. And so he gives him King Saul and there's this, this long back and forth. And so finally, he, he gets to a point to where, like, he kind of goes off on him. And he's like, you people are driving me insane. He was like, you don't need a king. You don't need Saul. Um, but I'm going to give you what you want. And by the way, God's not happy about it. And so then now they're kind of panicking because God's not happy that, uh, that, they got the, that they got this king. And so they don't want God mad at him. And so they finally admit, after some back and forth with Samuel, the Israelites finally admit that asking for a king was a sin, and they asked Samuel to pray that they won't die from their wickedness. And I love Samuel's response. Here's Samuel's response in chapter 12, verse 23. He says this, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Like, that's a big deal. He said, even though you didn't listen, over and over again, even though you didn't listen, or be it for me to not pray for you and sin against the Lord. Because he knew that God had placed him over the Israelites to pray for them. And so should he take out his anger or even righteous anger against them and just say, you know what, you guys are on your own. I'm going to let you do your own thing. Instead of doing that, he says, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. And even though you people kind of make me angry, <laughs> I'm still going to pray for you because I don't want to sin against the Lord. He said, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. So now we pick up in chapter 15. And, and uh, the title of tonight's message is this, Real Obedience. Real Obedience. And I, I feel like we're going to find what real obedience is by seeing what it's not. By seeing what it's not. Because we've got, uh, we've got Saul, who's now been made king over the Israelites, even though Samuel's like, this isn't going to work out. It's not a good idea. Fine, Saul's your king. And it's almost, this is kind of like that told you so, one of those told you so moments. And, uh, and we're going to see, we're going to see King Saul kind of obey, but it's not real obedience. And so that's what we're, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I have, as I'm sure all of us have, uh, have failed to have real obedience in our lives. What I mean by that is how many times have we kind of only obeyed a little bit, right? We're like, I'll do that, but I won't do that, right? And we kind of pick, or cho pick and choose the kind of obedience we're going to follow. Like, I'll, I'll believe this verse in the Bible, but I won't believe this verse in the Bible. Or I'll do this tough thing for God, but I won't do this tough thing for God. 
I don't know if I've told this story or not in Reach, so if I have, you'll just have to forgive me. Uh, but there was a time where my mom gave uh, me and my brothers, Christian, and, uh, and my brother Brandon, she gave, <laughs> Christian said X, he's, he's stumping me off the, yeah. Anyways, he hates when I tell stories about us growing up. Um, there was a time where we were playing out in the backyard, and we always made stupid makeshift stuff. We had like a, um, we had kind of a treehouse. I don't know what you would call that. It's really just a platform. That was all it was, like a platform built around a tree. But there were like no walls or anything. There was no house about it. It was weird. But that's beside the point. So like we just built the dumbest stuff. It really was stupid. Uh, we'd, we'd build uh, ramps for our bikes that went all of like this high, right? And one of the things we were going to do is we are going to build a swing. And so to build a swing, we took one board, tied a rope around one end, Threw it over uh, the the tree trunk or whatever, and uh, kind of tied a slip knot around the other. Pulled it down. We're like, cool. Now we have a swing. So we thought. Well, one of the things, one of the instructions that we were given uh, by by my mother was uh, to make sure you put away everything when you're finished before you start to swing, so you don't you know hurt yourself. Well, we didn't really listen to that part of the instruction. We just basically got permission and went and did our own thing. So we make this really bad makeshift swing, and for the record, I was kind of a chubby kid growing up, like, <laughs> like when I say I was kind of a chubby kid, I was an extreme chubby kid, uh, extremely chubby, and so uh, I get on that swing, and I promise the rope didn't break, okay, listen, <laughs> listen, I'm not going to lie on stage while I preach. I'm fairly certain that the rope didn't break, but the slip knot came untied because of the weight. But that's, anyway, just follow along. So, uh, so I go and I get to the very like bottom where most of the weight's going to be hanging. And I get to the very bottom right before I'm about to start going back up on the swing. And I get here and it comes untied as I remember it. And when it does, I hit the ground on my knees. But what happened was we didn't follow instruction. We only listened to part of our, our mom's instruction. And there was still some wood and some stuff on the ground. So when I hit my knees, I stand up. And in my, I believe it's my left leg. I have to look because I have a scar. This has been so long. In my left leg was a board nailed to my leg. Like I'm not kidding when I say there's a board nailed to my leg. I stood up and here's my leg and here's the board. And the board just goes like, and the nail I just watch come out of my leg, and it just falls, and then blood just goes, like a little tiny stream just starts coming down my leg. And, like, I'm a kid, and so I kind of start freaking out. I have to go to the hospital, get a tetanus shot, all that stuff. I tell that story because uh, we, I wanted something so badly, and I was given instruction on how to do it successfully, and by not listening to the full instruction, I wasn't giving real obedience to my mother, and in doing so, I hurt myself. And so, again, tonight we're talking about what does real obedience look like? Well, definitely it's not that, and it's not what Saul does. And so let's take a look. Um, So we've got uh, Samuel and Saul, and they're having a conversation. And uh, Samuel is talking to Saul, and he says, here's the deal. God has given me a word for you. Um, He says that there are these people, uh, let me Amalekites. There are these people called the Amalekites. And uh, back when Israel was released from Egypt, the Amalekites uh, attacked the Israelites. And it's just a really quick, brief story uh, in the book of Exodus, but they did. And so what he says is he says, um, this is what the Lord of the army says. I witnessed what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way when they were coming out of Egypt. Verse three, now go attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. And he gets, pretty, he gets pretty graphic and extreme. He says, kill men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels and donkeys. This is a word from the Lord. Like, that's extreme, right? Here's the first thing that we see, is we see that uh, Saul seeks instruction. He's given this instruction. So number one, if you'll throw that up there for me, Aaron, is seek instruction. In our lives, as we are called to do things in our life, uh, we need to seek instruction on what that looks like. What is the word of the Lord in our life? So for 
Saul, Saul has Samuel to come along and tell him, here's the word that the Lord has for you. So we are to seek instruction to, fit, to, to, to gauge what our walk would look like. And so this is, the, uh, this is the instruction that Saul has been given from Samuel. In other words, what he's been given from God. Uh, here's the first thing I want you to notice when it comes to us seeking instruction is don't be careless with the instruction in your life. Don't be careless with the instruction that you have in your life. And obviously, as we all know, the number one instruction that we're going to get from God is here. So if you're not here, well, not reach. Hi, everybody listening online, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, be here. I'm just kidding. If you're not here in God's word, I'm holding my Bible. If you're not here in God's word, then there's no way that you're able to seek God's instruction. I'm just being honest with you. Even if God sends godly people into your life, that's great. And there's, a, there's probably a good chance if they, if they really are someone who's walking with Jesus that they're giving you some good godly instruction. But like this is your go-to, period, the end. This always needs, your, needs to be your number one when seeking instruction. Needs to be the word of God. And we need to not be careless with the instruction that we get from the word of God. And so how do you treat, what is your attitude towards the word of God? Is it, oh man, I gotta have a quiet time, get that checked off my box. Oh, I gotta read the Old Testament because I've read the New Testament 37 times and I'm, I think I probably should read something different, right? Or I've read Proverbs for the 19th time. I guess I should go to Psalms now, right? Like what is our attitude towards the instruction that God has given us? Okay, let's not be careless with it. What is your attitude towards that instruction? How are you seeking God's instruction in your life? Are you spending time in his word? Also, um, do you have those godly influences in your life? Now, let me, let me tell you something. Influences in your life isn't the same as godly influence in your life. Hear me again. Influence in your life isn't always godly influence in your life, right? Here's a great example. Celebrities, they have all kinds of influence. Most of them are dumb, okay? Most of their influence is ill and they don't know how to give great advice, and they don't, like, they have no business in speaking up on some of the things they speak up on, but yet all kinds of people listen to them. I love that, uh, I can't remember, I can't remember what the segment's called, um, and I, I believe it's on Jimmy Fallon, maybe? No, Jimmy Kimmel. I think it's on Jimmy Kimmel, where basically they go, and they, they be, what is it called? Street Smarts. Street Smarts. I think that's what it's called where they begin to ask them questions about a certain thing and convince them they're talking about one thing when they're really talking about something different. For instance, like if these people are like anti-Trump or whatever, then they'll, they'll reverse what Trump said and be like, what do you think about that? And they're like, oh, this is why it's wrong and this is why it's dumb. And so they, then they begin to defend what Trump actually said. Now, this isn't a pro-Trump uh, illustration, just putting that out there. This is just an example. But I love that because, again, people, people so quickly want to listen to influence, and they want to listen to what the majority says. And that's not what God's word says. God's word says what God's word says, and that needs to be our influence. That needs to be where we go to. That needs to be where we seek instruction. And so uh, what we see here with Saul is he's given this very specific instruction. I'll read it one more time, then we're going to move on. It says, now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them at all. It says, do not spare them. Kill everything and everyone. So as we read the story, Saul gets everyone together. They go do their thing. Um, they, they kill everybody. Um, but they don't necessarily, he doesn't necessarily obey the way that he should. So number two is this, selfish obedience. And this is what we're going to witness in the life of Saul, selfish obedience. So starting in verse nine, it says this, Saul and the troops spared Agag uh, and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They, uh, they were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night long. So he didn't kill everything. Even though it, didn't, it doesn't make sense necessarily that God would want that to happen, 
That was the instruction he was given by the Lord. Sometimes the Lord will give us instruction in our life that just doesn't make sense. But obedience is where it's at. Real obedience and listening to that is where it's at. It says, do not spare them. And yet that's what Saul and the troops did. And so they kind of obeyed. They had selfish obedience. When I was, uh, I believe I may have been a senior. Uh, when I was a senior, we were at Falls Creek Church Camp. And one game that we did one night was the age-old game that many of you have probably played called Blender King. If you don't know what Blender King is, I shall tell you. Blender King is where you take a bunch of nasty stuff and you blend it together and you drink it. And whoever drinks it all is now dubbed Blender King. Correct. So it's, uh, it's senior year and uh, we've got all these different small groups for our youth group, right? There's like five or six small groups. And of course, like, no offense to the ladies, but like none of the ladies wanted to participate. They were like, oh, we forfeit. Let the guys play this game. So there was like four dudes, maybe a couple girls playing too. Yeah, Haley's like, I'll do it right now. Like, what we got? Come on, let's go downstairs. All right. So uh, anyways, we play the game. And what happens is me and, a, and one of my best friends, Mac, he's like a big old Hawaiian dude. He and I tie. Like we legitimately, we drink it all and hit our cups down and open our mouth at the exact same time. So they were like, okay. We need to have a battle to see who Blender King is. And so they were like, two of you are going are, are gonna to finish off what's in the blender. Here's the deal. They put all kinds of nasty stuff in there. I don't remember everything that was in there. I'm sure there was like relish and like mustard and spam and like all kinds of stuff. But two of the things that they put in there was ice cream was one thing and Swedish fish. Okay. Here's why that's important. Imagine a cup of vomit is basically what it tasted like. That's cold. So when you add Swedish fish, what happens? Yes, they get frozen. They get hard, hard as a rock. And so the deal was in order to win, you had to down everything in your cup, like no matter what it was. And so they, they do it real even. We get the same amount of frozen Swedish fish in our, in our little styrofoam cups. And like the whole youth group around us, we have the trash can in the middle and we, you know, we get it all, like we put it all in our mouth and we're trying to down it, but we're having to chew the Swedish fish. And it was tough. Like, it was so hard. So we're both, like, trying not to vomit, and we're, like, just looking at each other, like, <laughs> just chewing the nasty vomit fish. Like, it tastes like actual fish, like, out of the ocean. It was so bad. And, uh, and I, I will say, he spit, he spit it out, and I won. But that's not the point of the story. Okay, that's not the point of the story. point of the story is this is that the instruction that we were given is you got to finish everything in the cup, no matter what, and that's how you complete the instruction. And here's what happened. It's easy for everyone else to play Blender King when everything goes down real smoothly, right? It wasn't necessarily nice. It didn't necessarily taste good, but it went down pretty smoothly. Then things got hard, literally. The Swedish fish got hard. And when those things got hard, we had an option to either chew those Swedish fish and get them down or give up. Mac tapped out. When the Swedish fish got hard, he gave up. We were told not to give up. Here, Saul tapped out because things got hard. What necessarily got hard in this situation? His pride. Because he's there with these people that the Lord told him to destroy, spare nothing. And what he chooses to do is he spares the king, and then he spares anything that was worth uh, worth his while. Because what we're told at the end of this part right here uh, in verse 9, what we're told is they were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. So they destroyed anything worthless and unwanted, but anything with value they kept. His pride just got in the way. Th that temptation was difficult. He was with his troops. And here in a little while, we're going to see him throw his troops under the bus. But he's with his troops and that pride got there, and he decided that he was going to just give selfish obedience. Not real obedience, but selfish obedience. So why do we stop when things get hard? We all have our own answers. Why do you stop when things get hard? You just don't have the willpower to move on? You have a hard time trusting God? You have time, a hard time trusting those in your life? I don't know. But that's just a question I'm, I want to ask you guys. Why do you stop? When, those, when, when things in your life get hard or when those temptations come. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Our obedience 
is not dependent on our circumstances. We do not get to choose when we get to be obedient. Obedience to God is obedience to God, period, the end. When we know God is calling us to do something, we do it regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what makes sense, regardless of what people around us are saying. When God tells you to do something, you do it. Even when it's against the culture, even when it's against what's popular, when no one else in your life is telling you this is probably what you should do, but you know that God is telling you to do that, that's obedience. Obedience is not dependent on your circumstances. So before we move on to the last point, I want to ask you this question. In your life right now, talking to everybody, Pastor PJ as well, in your life right now, is there a place in your life where you're only giving partial obedience? Is there a place in your life where you're giving selfish obedience? I'll listen to this, but not quite this. I'll give this up, but not this up. Because if so, it doesn't end well. And we're going to see that with Saul. I mean, we see right here in verse 10, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I made Saul king. I don't know about you. I don't ever want the Lord to regret uh, putting me in the places he's placed me in my life because of my foolish actions. So is there any part of your life where you're only giving uh, selfish obedience? Number three, after selfish obedience, there's going to be a conversation between Samuel and Saul. And with the way that Sam, uh, Saul replies to, to this conversation, we see a selfish response. So number three is a selfish response. So like I said, verse 10, the, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, said, I regret that, that I've made him king. And so Samuel goes to have this conversation with Saul and, and basically call him out for what he did. And so picking up here uh, on verse 13, it says this, when Samuel came to him, Saul said, may the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instruction. So he, I mean, it starts off real positive. He's like, I did it. Like I did what, what the Lord told me to do. And then Samuel replied, then what is the sound of sheep, goats, and cattle I hear? Did you? Did you? Is God able to say that to us? Like, mm, did you do everything I've called you to do? Did you get rid of all of that part of your life that I told you, told you to get rid of? He says, then, then what is this? Saul answered, well, the troops, he starts off immediately blaming someone else. His, re, his first response, that's why it's selfish. His very first response when called out is this. Saul answered, verse, verse 15, Saul answered, the troops brought them, so he's already throwing them under the bus. The troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in the Lord, uh, and, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God but the rest were destroyed. I can't tell you how frustrated this makes me because I know way too many people in my life who love to play the God card. And I don't mean that disrespectful to God. I mean that disrespectful for the people that play that card. I'm doing this because God told me to, right? Like, dude, if you're gonna say that to anybody, don't say it to a prophet, like a dude that has a regular conversations with God. God told Samuel, don't spare anything. And then now Samuel's calling out Saul, and Saul goes, yeah, but, but I only did it to sacrifice to the Lord. No, man, you're making excuses. You're blaming the troops, and you're making excuses for your own selfish desires because you were not man enough to give real obedience. And instead, you gave selfish obedience, and now you're responding selfishly by throwing them under the bus and playing that God card. Knock it off. Knock it off. In verse 16, I love this, and I'm so thankful for the men in my life, the people in my life that God has given to say this to me. Verse 16, he says, Stop. And I say it like that because there's an exclamation in my Bible. Stop, explained Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord told me last night. He did not want to hear his excuses. He did not want to hear him playing the God card. He did not want to hear his stupidness out of his mouth, okay? Like he yells, he says, stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replies. <clears throat> Samuel continued, although you have once considered yourself unimportant, have you not become a leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Then you were sent on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder? and do what was evil in the Lord's sight. 
So he's told once, he makes an excuse. He's told twice, and what's he do in verse 20? The first word that comes out of his mouth. But that's us. That's what we do all the time with God, with people in our life who want to help correct us. But, but what about this? But that's not fair. But so-and-so was doing it. But, but, and that's what he says. But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission, blah, 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 and he begins to make excuses. Then Samuel, I love what he says. He says, look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than fat of rams. He tells him, your intention doesn't matter. What you intended to do does not matter because what the Lord wanted from you is real obedience. What the Lord wanted from you is real obedience. I'd write this down. Our obedience is that, uh, it should be on the screen. Our obedience is always worth more to God than our intention. Our obedience is always going to be worth more to God than our intention. We can have all the greatest intentions in the world, but do we follow up with them? And not just with God, but like just with our lives and the way that we live. I've been telling Johnny for like three weeks that I was going to take him to lunch. Like right before I got up here, I was like, okay, Johnny, tomorrow, I'm going to text you. We're going to go to lunch. My intention has been to spend time with him for three weeks, but my obedience has not been there as a real friend because I keep like just getting busy and, and not making that a priority. So it's not just, I mean, obviously it's most important when it comes to God, but it's just how we live our lives. Are we people of integrity? Are we people that live lives of obedience and what God calls us to do? So again, I want you guys to think about these things. Who is your Samuel? Who is that person, verse 16, that's willing to say, stop, knock it off, quit what you're doing, quit the excuses. Why aren't you being the person God's called you to be? Stop. Who is your Samuel? And is your Samuel walking this close to the Lord? And here's why I ask you that question is because sometimes we like to make excuses for other people in our life. And we're like, oh yeah, well, I have this person in my life who like holds me accountable. Or I have this person in my life, like we, we make sure we're both having a quiet time. But it's like, yeah, but like you're even better than that person at having a quiet time. So why would that person be the one to like help keep you accountable? That just doesn't make sense right? Like we know that Samuel was walking with the Lord. We know that Samuel heard from the Lord. And that's why Saul is able to trust this, uh, this accountability that he has for him. So when you think about the people in your life that you trust with accountability or the people that you put that title on, like this is my mentor, my disciple, or my accountability partner, my Barnabas or whatever, like whoever that is in your life, Can you look at their life and say, like, I trust 100% that this person is walking with the Lord and that the things that they tell me and call me out and call me out on is in line with what God's word says? Like, I I know Philip walks with the Lord. And so if he ever had to verse 16 me and yell, stop, I'm going to stop and listen to what he has to say because I trust that. I trust that. And he's he's earned that because I witnessed the Lord in his life. So who are those people in your life? And are you sure that those people should be those people in your life. Number four, this last thing that we see Saul do is we see him seek restoration. Number four, we see him seek restoration. So again, it's a lot of back and forth. And then we jump to verse 24. Apparently conviction has finally fallen over him. And it says this, Saul answered Samuel, I have sinned. About time you admitted it. Instead of blaming others and, but, but what about this? Finally, he says, I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command in your words. Because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. He knew the whole time. He knew the whole time and yet still tried to make excuses. He says, because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin and return with me so I can worship the Lord. He says, Samuel, I need you to return with me so I can worship the Lord. Please, like, give, bless me with that honor so I can turn back to the Lord. And even at first, Samuel's like, ah, no, I'm good. Like, I'm not going to go with you. He ends up going with him and uh, and gives him that honor, gives him that opportunity to to go back. But here's what happens. Samuel's like, all right, I'm going to do the job you couldn't do. 
And that's how the story ends. He says, I'm going I'm to do the job you couldn't do. Verse 32, Samuel said, bring me King Agag of Amalek. Agag came to him trembling for the thought, certainly the bitterness of death has come. And Samuel declared, as your sword made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. Then, this is graphic. This is the Bible. I love it. Then, I'm being honest, I do. Then he hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord at Giggle. Giggle? Gigal? Gilgal. Giggle. Giggle, Gigal. Gigal. He did what Saul was not willing to do. And that's, again, this instruction doesn't make sense to us in the 21st century, right? This whole story doesn't really make sense to us in the 21st century. But we know that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament is the God of today. God gave instruction, and he was to be honored. And he wasn't honored in Saul, but he was honored in Samuel. We are to honor God in the way that we give real obedience. So we see him seek forgiveness from God, forgiveness from his authority, right, Samuel, He's seeking that honor and says, please return with me. And then the last thing that we see as he seeks restoration, even though he he seeks restoration, he admits that he sinned. He says, Samuel, please go back with me so I can be uh, presented before the Lord and worship the Lord. Even though he did all that, which is great, we still see that there's a consequence for sin. And that, I see it all the time in students and that and teenagers, and they have such a hard time wrapping their minds around that. But, but God's forgiven me, and this person forgave me. So why, why are bad things still happening? Forgiveness isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card. Forgiveness is forgiveness. It doesn't get rid of consequence. Samuel went to Ramon. Saul went up to his home uh, in Gil- Gilbea of Saul. Even to the day of his death, Samuel never saw Saul again. Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted he had made Saul king over Israel. Again, I I hope the Lord never has regret for me. There's still consequence in his life. We're going to continue kind of down this road of of the book of Samuel and see how some of this plays out. But my challenge to you is this. As God has given you direction in your life, are you giving real obedience? Because understand that if not, even though there is going to be the opportunity to to find restoration and forgiveness in our actions, there will still be consequences when we don't give God real obedience. So what does that look like for you? What's it look like for you to give God real obedience? Every single one of us has our own walk. Hopefully it's straight and with the Lord. But every one of us have our own situations and our own circumstances and our own things going on. Don't be swayed by your circumstances. Don't be swayed by the people around you. Give real obedience to God when he gives you instruction. What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday evening at 630 at Evergreen Church, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. For more information, check out our website, reachtulsa.org. You can connect with us on social media and on Instagram by searching for reach.tulsa. Also, be sure to subscribe to our content for the latest sermons and updates. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Bring your glory down. Come feel your peace